Do you really want to see Jesus lifted up? Yes or no? As always, I will give an invitation so that those who want to open their heart to Christ will do so tonight. Do you know Jesus Christ? Have you opened your heart to Him or are you still searching? God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, Jesus. And the Lord has brought you here because He wants to draw you, you see? He wants to draw you into His family. But only one has ever brought us good news, and He's alive, and His name is Jesus. Born in 1934, Luis Palau grew up in a small resort town located in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Although raised with a strict Catholic upbringing, it was through the witness of a British missionary that Luis's parents came to personal faith in Christ. Luis's father, a successful businessman, had become active in boldly preaching the gospel, which had a profound impact on Luis's life. One day, when I was about six, I figured I woke up early and I, was, I saw light in the office that he had, and he was on his knees, and I went in, and it was early in the morning. I said, Dad, what are you doing? And he said, I'm reading the Bible, and I'm praying, and singing to the Lord, you know? And then he said something that later on came back to me. I said, what are you reading? He said, the book of Proverbs, he said. And he said, when you grow up, you read the book of Proverbs. It has 31 chapters, one for every day of the longest month, Read it every day and you'll be successful in family, in money, in studies, in everything. And it turned out to be that way. Just a few years later, Luis's father was diagnosed with bronchial pneumonia and at the age of 35 passed away. I was wondering, you know, what's, what's, what's God's plan? Why would he take my dad so young, so suddenly? In nine days he was sick and he died. And then I remembered my dad saying, read the book of Proverbs. And it, it, was, it became like my father teaching me, to me even today. Several journalists asked me, you, you talk about your father's death a lot. And, and I realized that I have. And now that I myself am 83, going on 84 this year, I begin to realize it had a big effect on me. He was left as an orphan father and his mother was a widow. And he's always had a, a burden for, for those people and, and has helped. And people don't know how much he's helped with, with that around, around the world. And so that, that was a profound influence when his father died when he was only 10. Sadly, uh, a few short years after Luis's dad had passed away, uh, the family uh, had lost uh, a lot of their, their wealth. And so Luis, I think the death of Luis's dad did a lot of things for him. One, uh, it made him grow up really fast uh, because he, was, he saw himself as responsible for his mom and his sisters. She was a typical wife of those days who bore children took care of the children, managed the house, and left all the big issues to her husband. So when he died, she really was at a loss. And it was that despite the situation in Argentina, and despite the fact that he didn't have any money, his mother encouraged him to become an evangelist. She definitely felt that, that he had a gift for proclaiming the gospel and that he should, uh, he should do it. And one day I said to her, Mom, I'm waiting for the call. And she got really upset about that. And she said something that really stuck with me and got me to make a decision. I will give my life to preaching the gospel and nothing else. She said, the call, the call, she said, the call was given 
2,000 years ago. The Lord wants the answer, not the call. <laughs> so that shut me out. So she was a great woman of faith, my mom, and uh, the death of my dad sort of brought it all together. As a young man, Luis started to stray away from spiritual things and drift into a life of parties and dances with his friends. Struggling with his walk with God, a turning point came when he was invited to go to Carnival, a weekend-long dance party. And I thought, you know, I've got to get back to the Lord. If I go to these dances with all the drinking, fooling around, who knows what's going to happen now. So I decided, I prayed that night. I hadn't pulled, I, pulled, I was alone in my grandma's home and I pulled out a Bible from somewhere, put it next to my night table. I said, Lord, please get me out of going to these dances. So the next morning I woke up and I felt something in my mouth that wasn't normal. I went to the mirror and my mouth was swollen like I had a tennis ball inside it. And I thought, that's it. The Lord has answered my prayer. I, now I can say, who's going to go to a dance with a foul looking mouth? I called up my buddies and I said, guys, I'm not coming to the dance. Oh, you got to come. And they came over and I covered my face. And I said, I can't go. My face is hurting. And uh, I was a coward to tell them I didn't really want to go, you know. So he, uh, they looked up and when they saw my face, well, it'll, the swelling will go away tomorrow. And I said, no, I'm not going. I've determined this is it. I'm not coming. And to me, that was a big decision. Soon after, Luis was listening to a radio program that gave him the inspiration he needed to get his life back on track. Little did he know that he was about to begin the journey that would fulfill his calling. I, mean, I didn't know Billy Graham from Adam. Uh, at that point, I'd heard of him because I heard him on shortwave radio once and his message, I couldn't remember. I just picked it up at the end. This is the dynamic voice that he had. You knew he had some power that the many other preachers didn't have. The question tonight is, can a man's heart be permanently changed? It impressed me, I got my attention. And he was coming to the end of his message. And he always ended up with an invitation. You know, if you want to receive Jesus Christ, bow your head. And, and I felt, I got to shape up. I've got to walk with God. I'm coming home. I really want to be a, a, a honest servant of God. And I said, Lord, I commit my life to you. Someday use me on radio to bless other people. Like this guy just blessed me. And, and we've been on for 60 years, you know. Well, at least we've been on the radio. And the Lord has really used it in a big way. So that was a big impact on, on my life, yeah. Luis began his ministry with evangelistic street meetings and opportunities to teach young people in surrounding churches. The first time they set me up to speak as a young guy to the youth of the church, you know, I was so nervous. I thought that I had a message for 40 minutes and I opened up, read the passage, and in 10 minutes I was through. <laughs> oh my gosh, they expected a 30 to 40 minute message and in 10 minutes I run out of stuff to say. So from then on, I, I began to feel, I'm gonna have so many notes that I'll have overkill here. All my life, the only thing I knew that I enjoyed and loved and was exciting was evangelize, evangelize. The more people you can reach, the more people are saved, the more testimonies you hear, that's life. Luis met two missionaries, Keith Benson and Ed Murphy, who came to Argentina to plant churches in areas that had no gospel. They enlisted Luis to join their team as the local evangelist and began their first mission effort in the small town of On Cativo. So I finished my message, I said, now, I'm gonna ask all of you to bow your heads, I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. If you want to know that you're forgiven, you have eternal life, you're going to heaven when you die, you receive the Holy Spirit, you become a child of God, pray with me this prayer. So I led them phrase by phrase, and I could hear a number of them pray. So when I finished, I said, okay, how many of you prayed that prayer and really received Christ? You know, uh, 32, I counted them. 32 raised their hand. And I thought, oh man, they didn't get it. You know, I just, it's too many. So I said, listen, let me explain it again. So I took about a half hour to explain again what is the assurance of eternal life. So then I said, okay, now I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. And there's a 37th raise their head. So I thought, this is of the Lord, you know. And then we decided we're gonna to have to do what Paul did, appoint elders, because we're leaving town. And Oncativo became a, they planted five churches in the following years. 
in late 1958, Luis met a pastor from California speaking at a conference and went up to introduce himself. The pastor began asking him questions. What's your future? What are your dreams? What do you want to do? Have you ever thought about coming to the US? I said, oh, I'd like to someday, but I'm not sure if I ever can. I've got to support my mom and my, my sisters. He said, well, the Lord can, can do something. You know, he could do, I had no idea that he belonged to the board of a foundation. Ray Steadman, he was a member of the board of directors of Overseas Crusades. And so he made, uh, in those days, OC, Overseas Crusades, had a field in Argentina. And so they had field missionaries down there and Luis started working with some of those field missionaries. And so Ray went down to visit them and that's how we got to know Luis while he was down there. And then they, they preached somewhat together. They got to know each other. And Ray had an innate ability to see potential in someone. He was very funny. And he could kind of teach you a lesson humorously. So you, after you thought about it, you thought, wait a minute. He was giving me sort of a lecture about something. He had a knack for spotting young men who had a real gift of, of leadership, a gift of evangelism, who Ray saw great potential in him. And he said, uh, I think you should come to the U.S. You could study the Bible and theology and so on. And I thought, wow, this is exciting. I showed it to my mom and my mom said, oh, this is the Lord's opening. This is of the Lord. I said, but what about you and the girls? Are we going to have money? The Lord will provide. That was her main answer always. Eventually then I came to the U.S. and it changed everything. Luis moved to Portland, Oregon and attended Mount Noma Biblical Seminary. While taking a graduate course in biblical studies, a young lady caught his eye and her name was Patricia Schofield. So we were in the same, took several of the same courses, and then we had, uh, what, uh, parties and so on. The, 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 there were 48 of us. 48, and there was only five guys in the 48. All the um, single guys. Singles, there yeah, some yeah, yeah. There were some married ones, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, kind of liked her right away. And she was loud and humorous, and then she played the piano. I thought, hey, any good evangelist wife should play the piano. I thought when people would say, oh, you know, I, he, seems to be, he seems to be everywhere you are, he's kind of around somewhere. And I said, well, that's just the way he is. He's really friendly, which is true. Okay, so we started, you know, dating as the Americans. In, in Argentina, you don't date alone. It's always in groups, you know, and so on. It was just a lot of talking to where we realized we had a lot in common. So we dated here and there, went to parties mostly. And then uh, I thought, no, I want to marry this woman. We started talking about where we were going to spend the rest of our lives. And then, you know, it, it, he just kind of saw, he kind of went around the back way to get into the subject. So I never asked her if she'd marry me. I said, would you be willing to go to Argentina with me? Because <laughs> she's a stupid way of declaring your love to someone. And she said, yes. And we were not kids, you know, I was 25. She was 23, so although they had rules for the freshman and uh, early on, uh, we figured, hey, we're mature. We can uh, talk we to each other. We broke the rules. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we're both committed to the Lord. We loved each other and had four boys, twins and two more. I wanted seven, but she said, you have the other three. You know, <laughs> so we never did have them. They're both realistic. They have both realistic expectations of themselves as uh, realistic expectations for their marriage. And uh, the thing that has always struck me about the two of them is uh, what an amazing team they are. She is very intelligent. And so she could help him even when he was, he, he was preaching. She, she had a biblical mind, she had a theological mind, and she could give him suggestions regarding his own messages. After they got married, they went off as missionaries, as a missionary couple, as a team. So uh, they've had a very strong marriage, and I think they've helped a lot of other uh, young couples. From the get-go, we were aware that we'd be separated. It got to be harder than we realized, I think. You don't see everything ahead of time, you know, but that all your life, there's again and again, you'd be, uh, you know, flying away, and she'd be staying home. 
when we were living overseas, that's when I, I, I recall feeling really lonely. Um, because you're, you're, you're struggling to adjust and adapt to a, a culture that is difficult at times, and it, it's a process. One day Pat and I counted, how many years did we, were we separated from each other because I was on the road? She came up with 17 years, you know, out of 57 now. It's a long time. At one period somewhere in Mexico City, we had four children under the age of five or six. No matter how you cut that, that that's stressful. And um, that's how I helped the ministry is by keeping a tight ship at home. Pat devoted herself to really bring up the boys. Uh, and you know, it's had a good effect because they love the Lord, serve the Lord, and, and uh, her devoting herself while I had to travel. I mean, you can't be an evangelist and stay home, either one or the other. He was never gone for weeks and weeks and weeks at a time. So it, it, it was never a massive uh, crisis or problem. Mom and Dad created such a great environment of living what they genuinely believed, going to the same church Sunday after Sunday going up. So we didn't feel like jet-setting people. We felt very grounded by the way that they lived their lives. We were at the youth group activities and uh, at church on Sundays and Sunday nights. And I wasn't even walking with the Lord. And I think of those in, with fond memories. Good people, lots of fun. And uh, that was one of the main things that drew our family together on a weekly basis. Luis's early journey on the mission field included ministry in Guatemala and Colombia and launching a radio ministry. Luis Palao responde. Muy buenas noches. Qué gran placer estar de nuevo con usted por estos breves momentos. Yeah, well, HCJB in Quito, Ecuador, which is next door to Colombia, uh, one of the guys who sang f with me, soloist Bruce, Bruce Del Monte, we call him. Bruce worked at HCJB and he managed to get us on on a daily basis on radio, and we called it Cruzada in those days with Luis Palau. Still exists with the same name, Bible teaching. And HCJB at that time had a television station and they were willing to try what Luis volunteered for. And I think he was the first one to use, to use it to evangelize. He had the idea of letting people call him, which terrifies me, not, not, know, not knowing what's coming. But, but he, he loved it. Y ahora Luis Palau responde. Señor Palau me dice Some of the questions were delicate, you know, not only husband-wife relationships, parents-children, religion, faith, salvation, you know, any question could come in. And Luis would, uh, would answer the question, but he'd bring in the good news and show the relevancy of Jesus Christ to their question, to their issue. Hi, it's good to be back again here on Channel 10 in Medford, and uh, I want you to know that this, as the ad said, is more than just a talk, talk show. show. Where everybody kills time talking about whatever uh, subject crosses their mind. Our program tonight is to help people who are hurting. And we want you to know, I have a telephone right here, cup of tea, and my New Testament right here. In Ecuador, the Communist Party secretary, a woman, a fiery, woman who had killed several people and everything, she called up, came in for an interview. We led her to the Lord. The Communist Party of Ecuador was revolutionized. And boy, we saw so many people come to the Lord and churches planted too, as a result of that program. As the campaigns were steadily growing, Luis had been working and praying for many months with local leaders for a spiritual breakthrough in the city of Bogota, Colombia. Despite being a dangerous place for believers to share their faith, a parade and a four-day crusade had been planned in December of 1966. We got into the downtown Bogota, it's called Bolivar Plaza, and uh, the paper said 30,000 came. We kind of thought it was more like 20, but still it was big. And it was the biggest thing that we'd ever seen in Colombia or in many other countries even. There was an important prayer meeting 
that was held where they got down on their knees because they knew that there was a possibility of violence and that they, they could be even killed if they did. So they wanted to make sure that God was with them in this and they got down on their knees and prayed and prayed and prayed all day. The Christ followers were not used to they would not think it was a smart idea to gather together in, in close proximity because bad things could happen. The fact that the, the younger generation perceived, and Luis was kind of their ringleader, that th this could be a new era, that this could be a new day. It was just exciting to see everybody cheerful. And everybody expected trouble could happen. Suddenly we see some police cars coming towards us and we thought, oh boy, this is bad. There's going to be a problem. And then on the contrary, they turned around and opened and led the way to the, the plaza. It was really quite a victory. And the guys, it was, they were elated and so were we. I think the most important part of that is it was a breakthrough because it changed the mentality of the Christians toward public events, toward what they were gonna do about evangelism in the future. From then on, Things began to change in Colombia. Uh, doors opened, churches respected each other, unity began to evolve in Colombia, and now they've got leaders that are amazing. I mean, some of the leaders in Colombia right now, who were kids then, uh, you know, they have 100,000, 200,000 people, no joking. These are real numbers of what the Lord has done in the country. They were university students, young pastors, and now the church is enormous, 11, 11 million believers. And when we were just there, you couldn't believe the number of people that turned out. And most of them were young, and that's, that bodes well for the future. A few years later, Luis and Pat moved to Mexico, where Luis continued leading citywide crusades by planning, praying, and working alongside the local churches. Glorious day. Good crusade weather. Yeah, Mexico is always a tough country. Not against uh, evangelical Christianity, just the religion in general. Because in Mexico in those days, it was against the law to have uh, public rallies like that to preach the gospel. And so we decided whether we were going to do it or not. We got down, we prayed all day long, and got up and again to a man we think God's behind this. And that led to uh, like, I think 14 campaigns that year in Mexico. I mean, we were young, full of energy. And we just had campaign after campaign after campaign. Just, you know, more than one a month. Bull rings, arenas, tents, everything we could. And it's, it's good to minister in Mexico. And now Mexico, uh, in the Spanish world, probably has more believers than any other country. The Palau ministry team began to expand throughout Latin America with larger scale crusades and the use of secular media to spread the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ. The people, the other kids were beginning to preach in campaigns. Uh, things were beginning to happen all over. Christian radio stations began to pop up all over the place. It was a victory for the gospel in Latin America. And I think the use of radio, TV, and mass meetings blew it open. What impacted me was to say only God could take a, a, a young boy from a suburb of Buenos Aires, um, growing up in a church of 30 people, and, and somehow in this environment where you weren't getting uh, this, this support or vision, his dad dies, they have no money, somehow God plants in the heart of this young Argentine boy, you are going to go all over Latin America and the world and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ at a citywide level, reaching countries. Only God could plant that vision. Certainly it comes out of a genuine love for people. I've seen that always. You see it if he's one-on-one -on -one with the cab driver. I've heard him, even if it's a five or ten minute little cab drive somewhere, he's looking for opportunities to share the good news one-on-one -on -one or, or his deep love for the neighbors with whom God's placed him. And then, of course, that preparation in front of a large crowd of hundreds of thousands of people. Many of you are going through your own war. It's a spiritual war between God and
One of our secret prayers was that we would be able to influence presidents, military personnel, including dictators, for the good, to protect the people, to make them see the nation and the position God gave them as from God. And I learned watching Billy Graham. I learned to just be unashamed. And I, with respectful, humility, just serve the people. But at the same time, you're in the name of the Lord. You're not there just as a little weasel from Argentina trying to convince this guy to change. You're speaking in the name of Jesus Christ. He has an, uh, just an amazing passion and a heart for the lost. It would be great if more Christians had that same passion and, and heart. It, it pains him deeply to think anybody might not be able to spend eternity in heaven. I remember in one country, uh, we had a presidential prayer breakfast. I said to the president, sir, when the breakfast is over, can I see you privately with nobody else there? None of my team, none of your guys. He said, okay. So I got in there and I said to him, you know, I use the four laws, you know, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, but you gotta know Christ, etc." And he said to me, you know, God can't love me. He said, Palau, if I told you the stuff I've done as a military person, you know God couldn't love me for nothing. I said, sir, God still loves you in spite of your sins. And the guy finally got on his knees and I led him to the Lord. To all those who receive him, who believe in his name, he gives you power to become a child of God. Will you receive him tonight? He used to listen to Billy Graham all the time, and that's where he got his, his vision for the entire world kept expanding and expanding. When we were living in Mexico, Luis's, I thought Luis's vision was only for Latin America, Spanish-speaking world, and it wasn't. He's a man who really doesn't need an introduction, but he's a, a special friend of my father's, and it's a privilege for me to be able to introduce to you Dr. Luis Palau, our speaker this morning. Dr. Palau. Luis credits Dr. Billy Graham and his organization for the encouragement, support, and knowledge needed to launch and sustain a worldwide evangelism ministry. Luis first met Mr. Graham in Fresno, California, where he actually was on staff helping with the Fresno, California crusade back in 1962. And Luis and Pat were involved in some of the logistical issues, busing. They were uh, behind the scenes working with the crusade director. And they were able to learn a lot about citywide mass evangelism. We learned a lot about how to organize a campaign through watching the Billy Graham team doing it in Fresno. And I was the assistant to the director. So everywhere he went, I went, carried his briefcase, sometimes drove the car and uh, just was there learning from him. He observed how the Graham team did things, how they, uh, how they mobilized more than anything else. He analyzed Dr. Graham's sermons. We learned so much from Mr. Graham, you know. When we finally left the mission to form our own team, and he put one of his guys on our board of directors, and he gave me good advice uh, all through the years. Crusades throughout Asia and Europe were taking place as Luis and his team planted churches and preached the gospel to thousands of people. As the Luis Palau Singapore mission passed the halfway mark, the country's successful, well-educated people were hearing that Christ is relevant to their lives. But God wants to deal with your soul tonight. Jesus Christ is for today. We had a women's luncheon in Singapore where 5,000 women showed up. And the parking was so impossible and the traffic so bad. People, the women just parked the car anywhere and walked to the hotel. Then the next day the paper said, Christian women's traffic jam. <laughs> I love that title. Dear Chinese friends, we're talking about meeting God and Jesus Christ who is alive today. The Bible says when you and I die, we'll go to heaven if we have Jesus in our heart. Señor Jesucristo, ningún otro murió por los pecados del mundo. He says this from the Word of God. I have loved you with an everlasting love. God not only forgives you, he comes to live within you. Jesus said, 
He calls his own by name. Jesus came to give you life. Then, in 1980, while leading a six-week campaign in Scotland, Pat arrived to speak with Louise. She came to Glasgow the last weekend of the festival, I think, and uh, she seemed somber, you know. And I thought, oh, what have I done? You know, she's mad at me or something. So finally, on the last day or two, I said, hey, babe, what's, you know, you, you seem to be upset. And so I said, well, yeah. So touch here. So I took my finger and I touched, uh, and there was a lump. She said, I think this is bad, you know. So I said, okay, we go home Monday and let's go straight to the doctor and uh, have it checked out. I couldn't believe it. You know, I, I guess we always think that things like that happen to weak people. I don't know what I thought, but I, I was really surprised that usually you get a kind of a fear about, you know, you feel something and you think, I gotta get that checked out, but I'm sure it's fine. In this case, get it checked out is not fine. She said to me, as we were driving home, which wasn't far, to our house, she said, well, babe, this is the end, she said, because they discovered cancer, you know. So I said, you know, I felt it might be the end too. You know, in those days, cancer was considered, that you're done, that's it. I planned my funeral. I, I went all, you know, I went the route that probably all people do. No, not me. I said, no, no, the Lord's gonna keep you well. The boys, you know, they need you and so on and so on. So we got to the house, the boys were in school and I was down in the basement really crying and thinking all the stuff I should have done with her, you know. And suddenly from upstairs, she's playing the piano. I hear the piano. And at first I thought, oh my gosh, she just finds out she's got cancer and she sits at the piano singing. And then I thought, but what an amazing thing. A Christian can actually do that, you know. You know where you're going uh, when you die. Of course, looking back now, I did survive. Well, that's the grace and mercy of God that, that um, he chose to uh, heal me. But um, at the same time, I had friends who did not. And, and heaven is our home. And uh, this is the battleground. This is where we work out who we are, what, we, what we're here for, and ultimately, we're on our way. I'd like to talk about what I see the Bible teaches about heaven and how a believer can face it with peace because you really literally are just leaving the body behind and going into the presence of the Lord forever and ever, and it's perfect, glorious. While Pat was recovering from cancer, Luis kept his travel schedule to a minimum, continuing campaigns in the U.S. and overseas. A few years later, Luis and his team planned an ambitious schedule of crusades spanning a two-year period in England. Mission to London probably was uh, one of the highlights of Luis's uh, ministry. L Luis has always been quite keen on saturation evangelism. Let's lift, lift up Jesus and touch the entire city. Let's reach every segment of society with wave after wave of gospel proclamation. Every place you went, on the tube, uh, uh, on billboards, on the sides of those double-decker buses, you couldn't get away from Luis. <laughs> you know, he was everywhere. Phase one, uh, we did week-long crusades in about 10 different boroughs all, all over the city. It mobilized the churches, and it, it, I think it gave a, a vision, especially to young people, as to what was possible. Uh, phase two, when we, back in, when we went back in 84, we stayed in one stadium, Queens Park Rangers football stadium for, uh, golly, six weeks. Night after night of just uh, preaching the, the good news. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. The grace of God, see? I was uh, 10 years old and I got taken along to the QPR soccer stadium in London. I just remember um, hearing this guy get up to speak who I know, now know as Louis Palau, and, and he spoke so much about the Father heart of God, and it really struck me. And even if your father was a poor example, and your mother left your family, you come to the living Father. He is the ideal Father. He is a Father who loves you. The Bible says God so loved the world. He connected with me straight away. I, I kind of liked the way he was delivering 
the message. I don't even know if I'd come across a preacher who was quite so passionate and animated before. You know, I grew up in the Church of England, Anglican Church, and it was a pretty lively one by, by those standards, but I still hadn't quite heard anyone like Luis. And, and the thing that really started to spark something in me was when he talked about God as a father. And I'd already lost my father by that age, obviously three years before. And so it was a very relevant subject for me. I had heard a lot about God in my life up till then. I knew he was the creator. I knew he was the one who gave me breath. Um, you know, I believed in the Bible and all that kind of thing. But I don't think I've heard anyone emphasize quite in this way that God is your father and he's a perfect father. And it just made a whole lot of sense to me. You have God's eye upon you. And the Lord has brought you here because he wants to draw you, you see, into his friendship. He wants to draw you into his family. So when that came that moment at the end of the night, and he gave an invitation for people to come to Christ. Um, that seemed like a bit of a no-brainer to me. I just remember walking out of the stadium that night, just walking on air, just feeling like something had happened in my life. And I don't really remember a whole lot of the journey home, but I, do, I, do, I remember leaving that stadium and thinking like, wow, that was the best night of my life. Throughout the next decade, crusades in Peru and Hong Kong had record-breaking attendance. Large events were also held in New Zealand, Kenya, Poland, and Fiji, just to name a few. Blessed be Egypt, my people, says the Lord. You may not be an atheist. And yet in your heart there's an emptiness. Luis was one of the first evangelists to enter the Soviet Union after the fall of the Iron Curtain. The Apostle Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Apostle Paul говорит, я не стыжусь благовествования Христова. Because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. But it was during the campaign in Jamaica of 93 that Luis and Pat saw God revolutionize the life of one American that they had been praying for all their lives. Well, I feel like I'm a little bit of a poster child for our campaigns, you know, for mass evangelism in this, that I came to faith at a Luis Palau festival in Kingston, Jamaica in 1993. I was 27 years old and uh, I had lived all those years far from the Lord. I had a rebellious spirit. I wasn't the stereotypical rebellion, you know, mad at God angry at his parents, you can't shove your religion down my throat. Though That wasn't my attitude at all. I just was sort of like the weaselly, wormy, follow the path of least resistance kind of guy. I wanted to party and have fun and I just wanted people to leave me alone. I didn't want to hassle with people. I didn't want to embarrass my parents or put anybody down. I just wanted to do exactly what I wanted to do and I went that way for 27 years. It included a lot of partying, alcohol and drugs, and all the relationships that go along with that. As the years went by, we felt very sad that he could make decisions that would make his return or his coming to faith very difficult. Pat and I worked together on it. We were fully aware we didn't want our kids to be, you know, go to hell and go to the world and behave like pagans. And when he was with us, he was marvelous and wonderful and smart and um, affirmed everything that mom and dad liked, but, but we knew he was lost. And for those few years when Andrew was not in the kingdom, it was hard, you know, but we left him with the Lord and trusted the Holy Spirit to work him over. They never gave up and they didn't want me to just be a good boy, but they wanted to see my life transformed and that was what was on their heart. Luis prayed for years for Andrew. He had, he had all of his friends, a lot of people praying for him. It, it pained him dearly that Andrew was living this kind of lifestyle and not walking with the Lord. And I mean, Luis would write him letters and, and, and pour out his heart to Andrew. What are you, you're messing up your life, Andrew? What are you doing? Met some young people who had recently been radically transformed by the gospel and they were talking about it and it caught my attention and it began uh, in my spirit this hopefulness, maybe this could work for me. 
we were encouraged by his attitude, how, how these new friends that he had made, they were just a step ahead of him and they knew what his needs were and they were not put off by his hypocrisy and so on. And then every night at the Kingston National Stadium with thousands of people, I heard the message and it was starting to press in on me. And on the final night, I really just recognized that I had this need and I desired to walk with God and I didn't want to keep going the way I was going. And Jesus says, young man, you've got to make your own decision. You cannot have a third hand faith. You cannot inherit your faith from your folks or your grandparents. God has no grandchildren. Andrew said that the other kids afterwards, they wanted to go out and play and he said, no, I'm gonna stay behind. And he said he spent all afternoon confessing every one of his sins and weeping over every one of them and got it all out before the Lord. Now he's an evangelist. It was a really a radical moment. Uh, healing, forgiveness, a burden of shame and guilt really was palpably lifted out of my life and my spirit and uh, a joy overcame me. He healed me of my addictions and began from that point forward to restore relationships. It put me in such a good position for discipleship and growth. I even met my wife. She was one of the young people whose example uh, I was very interested in. So good things happen at the festivals. It was an exciting time and when I get discouraged about some other area of life, um, I think about that. God's goodness is not to be taken for granted. Being an ambassador of the good news, Luis will state that there is no greater joy than helping lead someone to Jesus Christ. To reach a younger generation, the crusade model evolved into a festival complete with rock music, extreme sports and family activities integrated with the gospel. But along with the success of these events came its share of challenges, dangers, threats on Luis's life and tough criticisms, one of them being the sincerity of true conversions in mass crusades. My answer is, in the Bible, it talks about the multitudes, the crowds, and so on. Different terms for crowds, 152 times in the New Testament. So if the Lord isn't offended, but why should we be? Maybe what we ought to do is bury the word mass. It gives the impression of just herding sheep into the, you know, sheepfold and they don't know what's going on and, and they've been manipulated in some way. Secondly, young people in particular love to come in large groups and be together and with good music that they can enjoy. They love it and then they calm down and they listen to the message. When we talk to a person one-on-one, -on -one, that's evangelism because we're telling them what they need to know and because we really care. Um, but it's no different if there's a, a large group of people there. And besides the gospel needs to be proclaimed to as many people as possible, crowds draw people and people draw people. So why not do it, you know? He has such a love and a, and a, and a heart and a passion for, for people. And uh, he wants everyone to know that they can be saved and have their sins forgiven. That's what God has called evangelists to do, to spread everywhere the aroma of Jesus Christ. Conversion is not the work of man. We do our little bit, we become instruments of God. So it's the Spirit of God who converts the person by convicting him of sin and of the reality of Jesus. And so the Holy Spirit is in a stadium as much as one-to-one -one at McDonald's. There was opposition, there was no doubt about that. Sometimes in the smaller cities it was on radio, don't go to hear this guy, which just made the people want to go and hear him. And, uh, we, we had some things, we got some death threats, you know, and, and things like that. Yeah, there have been uh, incidences through the years where we've had uh, bomb scares, uh, where we have been in you know, some pretty dangerous uh, places, but uh, that never stopped us from you know, going to a country or uh, mobilizing the churches and preaching the good news. Now, we were in Peru, and we were up in a city called Arequipa, and um, we did get a 
pretty serious death threat there. Uh, he got a message from the Shining Path Corellas that uh, they had put on a contract out on him and he was going to die a dog's death. They was a real threat. They gave me a, uh, it was a closing night and I'm leaving and people give you envelopes and you just put them in your pocket, you know. We get to the room and we were singing praise God from whom all oh, blessings flow and praising the Lord. At my chest I opened this envelope. I read it and it was said, you're going to die like a dog, you pig, you son of a this and that. You're going to die, you're not going to leave this valley. It was in Arequipa, which is way down south in Peru. And there was no way out except the plane, two a day, one leaving, and or driving through the territory controlled by the Shining Path. We went in suddenly at the last minute when the plane engines were already going and the police said, we'll take you there, boom, get up there fast and get this plane out of here. <laughs> Every, you looked at everybody, who's the killer, you know, but we got out. I'd never been sick a day in my life, really. I was 83 last November, and uh, uh, I'd never been in a hospital overnight, nothing. I hardly even took aspirins, I just didn't take anything. And then suddenly I had a cold I picked up somewhere in the south, and then went to England, and in England I wouldn't go away. So on December 22, last year, we go over to this oncologist, and he says, I've studied your, your x-rays and all this, I said, it's bad news. It is a malignant cancer, it's inoperable, uncurable. Science has no way of curing it. Of course, you first got the initial shock and almost disbelief in the sense of you can't quite process it because anyone who's known Luis Palau over the decades, you see a guy who's been unusually healthy. Every cancer is different. Treatments have really improved, but uh, I don't. I don't know what what the future holds. I don't know whether they will keep giving him he, he, the treatment will continue to be as effective as it is. When you know that you might be dying sooner than you had planned in your little head, uh, Satan attacks, and I think people ought to be aware of it. Uh, Satan comes with subtle questionings about the goodness of God, the forgiveness of God your relationship with God, and it's very real. It's a spiritual warfare, and you gotta resist him in the name of the Lord and in the power of the Holy Spirit with the word of God and the blood of Christ so that he has to flee. Rather than it filling us with a sense of dread and, and despair, it's given us even more hope because when you see someone that's genuinely walking with Christ um, and walking through maybe the hardest physical season of their life with joy in the Holy Spirit, um, it changes you. What I have experienced personally, me and my wife and uh, our children, is just that this has been a joyful season, a really encouraging time in life to see your father face the most difficult uh, enemy, the Bible calls death the final enemy, and he's taking it on seriously, soberly, honestly, but joyfully. You know, everything that he has preached about eternity and being ready for that time and uh, the peace and confidence that you can have, uh, we've seen it in his life. To be able to end with joy, with peace, you know, that I could, that the boys and other people could remember my going to be with the Lord the way I remember my dad, singing, clapping, and, you know, praising the Lord and quoting the Bible. What a way to go. <laughs> Pat said, you know, we've had such a good life. We've been blessed to meet important people. We've ministered to high and low to the masses, to uh, politicians, to rich people, to poor people. It's been a, a glorious time. I can tell you all kinds of stories about how he sees. When, when you look at a room, you just look at it, and he's thinking how many people, can, how many chairs can you put in here? I mean, once he took the kids to the circus, and I know from a friend who told me, he was sitting there thinking how he could make that venue into an evangelistic setting. 
because that's the way he sees everything. I used to say in the old days uh, that I hope the boys were my uh, my headstone, yeah. And they would put something like, you know, my dad wasn't perfect, but he sure loved Jesus Christ. <laughs> I hope they, they can say that, you know, yeah. It, it's, yeah, perfect, from, far from perfect, but I love the Lord, you know, and I hope people remember that. Dad's left me a legacy of loving the Church of Jesus Christ, loving unity in the body, of loving the gospel, and, and, and really wanting to be unashamed of the simple proclamation of Jesus Christ. Dad's always modeled uh, that open, open-handedness, uh, an open heart with what, whatever he has, whatever he's been given, he wants to, to share that with others. His perseverance, his love for unity, uh, for the body of Christ in the local church, those are the things that I think have really kept him on target, uh, moving forward towards his main goals of winning as many people as possible, to Jesus Christ and uh, preparing God's people for works of service. Well, to uh, have my wife feel the same way I do and together to, you know, give it all for winning people from hell, you know. I, I still think that we need to allow ourselves the Holy Spirit to soften us, that people without Christ are going to hell. And it's not a joke and it's not a swear word. It's a place where people go. But the other joy is my boys, yeah? They um, walk with the Lord and serve the Lord. And it's just sheer pleasure to see them, you know, walking with God. It's very good. And, and then, of course, the thousands who've come to the Lord and the millions that we've been able to preach to, it's the greatest joy. I mean, what, there's nothing like it, you know what I mean? You're dealing with eternal issues. Uh, you're dealing with the most exciting thing in the world, leading people to Christ, leading them to God, leading them to, to enjoy life on earth by the power of the Holy Spirit and how to really live life. The life that everybody dreams is the life that Jesus Christ gives. As Luis and Pat prepare for the next chapter of their lives, plans have already been made to pass on the ministry to their sons and teach a new generation of evangelists to share the good news of the world. The board made the, the move to have Kevin Palau become president and CEO, and Andrew, as, uh, as an evangelist, to eventually take over for his daddy. And transitions and succession plans, they're, they're always messy, but to the, I think to the real credit of uh, of our board of directors and the Palau family, uh, it came together and uh, we, we believe as a ministry, our best days are ahead of us. Uh, one of the reasons dad is, is so full of joy, even as he struggles through uh, with cancer, is that he knows that the organization is in solid hands in the sense that he's developed a team, including his own sons, that share the same passion to see the gospel shared in the unity of the body of Christ. So as we look forward, 10, 20 years down the road, we see Palau festivals continuing to take place all around the world. We have a vision to see at least 10,000 evangelists in 150 different countries, part of the world's first truly global network of evangelists. I've said to these young guys over and over, an evangelist without a team doesn't get very far. You have to have a group of godly men and women around you who walk with God, who have the same passion, and who want to glorify God and win people to Christ, that their main passion in life is this. But it's all of God. The inspiration of the Bible is the work of the Holy Spirit. The gathering of the people of God is the Holy Spirit. The proclamation of the good news, the Holy Spirit delights to apply the good news. So you depend on Him. And you depend on Him not only for proclamation of the gospel, but also for living the Christian life. And so Luis wanted to, to encourage evangelists without having them have to become part of our organization. And that's what birthed NGA, Next Generation Alliance. Knowing that we've got the Next Generation Alliance with 750 evangelists we're working with, and uh, with Andrew, he's become an amazing evangelist. He's, he's so anointed, his, his preaching is outstanding. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of people surrender to Jesus at his outreach events. So we're, we're excited about, about the future. This has been a great season for us and there are so many open doors around the world for the gospel and for the ministry 
And that's something we didn't take for granted and we always wondered what will happen when dad gets to this place. Will we be able to continue as we expect, as we have felt God calling us to, and to see the church responding to say, yes, we love Luis Palau, we honor him, his legacy is unique and incredible, but we gotta keep going forward. There's unity here. We're, we're together around the gospel and we're believing for souls and uh, uh, there's a confidence in not just dad, but the team and all the things that he has invested into us is, is gonna continue to bear fruit. We really are honestly believing that there are greater things yet to come. To all of you watching this TBM program, I want to encourage you, if you've never met Jesus Christ, that at this moment you would give Him your life. It is very good news, like we've said in one segment of this program, uh, the best news the world has ever heard, that God loves you, that He has a plan for your life, that God wants to come into your life and take over, that God wants to make you His child, forgiving all your sins through the blood of the cross, coming to live within you by the Holy Spirit, and then assuring you that when you die, you go straight to heaven for all of eternity because you have eternal life, because you become a child of God. But if you want to become a child of God, even right now, what you have to do is be honest enough to admit your sinfulness and you don't deserve the love of God. Secondly, to believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God who died on the cross for you and rose from the dead and He's alive today because He is God. And thirdly, that you open your heart and receive Him into your life. I can help you to meet Jesus Christ if you really mean it by a prayer in which you invite Him into your life. So I'll guide you in a prayer wherever you are. If you're in a hotel or something, find a spot where you can pray. If you're alone at home, get on your knees and let's pray together to God and invite Christ into your heart, okay? So let's pray. Oh God Almighty, thank you that you're a God of mercy. I deserve to be condemned because of my sins. But I thank you that you love me so much that you sent your one and only Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and that on the cross, He took away all my guilt, all my sin, all my evil, as well as that of the whole world. And right now, Lord Jesus Christ, I thank You that You rose from the dead. I thank You that You're Almighty. And I receive You into my heart. I open the door. Please come into my life wash away all my guilt, give me a new heart, fill me with your Holy Spirit, make me a clean, holy person, and give me the assurance of eternal life. And one day in heaven, Lord, I'll fall at your feet to thank you for saving me forever and ever. In Jesus' name, amen.